everybody, and welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program. This program is being pre recorded, so you can watch it at your leisure. And hopefully, soon it will also be available on Hernando County Government YouTube. So you can either watch it on Facebook or through the YouTube channel. Today's program is a special program for current events um, called Monarchs, Milkweed and myths. I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities in water conservation, and my program is Florida Friendly Landscaping. If you have any questions once you watch this pre-recorded video, if you have any more interests, because I have a lot of links um, where I got information on this video, don't hesitate to email me at lilyb, L-I-L-L-Y-B, at hernandocounty.us and say, hey, I'd like a PDF copy of that program, or I'd like, you know, some more of those links that you utilized. Here are the nine principles of Florida-friendly landscaping, and the one we're going to cover fairly in-depth today is number five attract wildlife. That is the fifth principle of Florida friendly landscaping. Um, pollinator garden, butterfly gardening. Those are always topics that we cover. Today we're going to cover a specific, mostly a specific butterfly, our friend, <coughs> the monarch butterfly. So it's been in the news. It's been all over Facebook. It's been all over Instagram, all over, you know, social media. Um, that the monarch butterfly um, was listed as a endangered species. So we're, what we're going to do, and let me first say, I am not an entomologist. I am not a butterfly expert, specifically. Um, and I'm sure you will hear more from experts as we get further down the line. Um, I'm even going to show you some upcoming classes by some other people, you know, university um, agents, professors, things like that, who are going to tell you maybe a little bit of a, uh, you know, different spin. The, you know, people who watch these type of programs, you always want more knowledge. So there's nothing wrong with getting more knowledge. What I'm here to, to do today is kind of present to you the research I did for myself to try and glean out from all the chatter that's going on, you know, where what is the most reliable information? Let's just put it that way. So on July 22nd, 2022, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that is the name of the group. They are based out of Switzerland. They added the migratory monarch in North America to its red list of threatened species, and they classified it as endangered. This has not um, happened through any United States organization um, at this juncture on August 9th, 2022. Um, so just so you know where the information is coming from. And um, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, we're going to leave all those things up to you because actually I'm also going to present to you a lot of unknowns and we are going to have to, um, you know, make our own decisions in life, what we feel is best. But just remember, we've been hearing about this for a long time. This isn't new news. This isn't anything to that, you know, happens suddenly and that we have to react um, irresponsibly or hurriedly. Um, we should act, yes, but, you know, just act calmly and act responsibly. And according to uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the Western population is at the greatest risk of extinction, having declined by an estimated 99.9% from as many as 10 million to 1,914 butterflies between the 1980s and 2021, 
the eastern population also shrunk by 84% from 1996 to 2014. And then below is a link where you can find their information. Just so you know, there are um, butterfly experts who disagree with these numbers. But we're, we're just letting you know where that declaration came from. And then it hit all the media outlets. And of course, all we hear is monarch butterflies endangered. Should we um, do the best we can do to help all pollinators? Of course. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I have a group of people who uh, watch some of my uh, programs once they make it on YouTube. Um, they're kind of my um, my critiquers. They are um, fans of mine, but they also give me a lot of feedback. Um, it's a small group, and we do have a lot in common. We all, you know, love nature. We love gardening. We all have the same parents. That is <laughs> the things that we have in common. So my brother says that I need to tell you more of why, you know, why these things I talk about are important. So here we go. Why are monarchs important? They're beautiful. They're a hot button issue to get people excited because they're beautiful. <laughs> but what, what does it mean in my life if we've lost the monarchs? Well, they are, they are definitely pollinators. All butterflies that I am aware of, there may, as I said, I'm not a butterfly expert, but well, let's just say most butterflies are pollinators. Are they the most efficient pollinators out there? No, 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 that would be our friends, the bees. <laughs> the bees, that's their main job on earth is to pollinate, but butterflies are certainly backups in that. <coughs> they, they add you know, they augment the pollination process as well as do beetles, ants, um, even mosquitoes, all sorts of things. So in their process of laying eggs and nectaring, doing all that they do, they happen to pollinate. They're called incidental, incidental pollinators. This is probably one of the very most important parts is they are part of the food chain. They are a food source out there in nature, um, even some of the caterpillars. And yes, I know we wanna save all the caterpillars, but you know, some caterpillars, maybe it has been their fate to be a delicious, soft, easy to swallow, nutrient filled uh, breakfast for a baby bird. That's just the way that, that nature works. And we're gonna get a little bit more into that as well. And one of the things they are, as I mentioned, they are beautiful. So they're a kind of have become the superstar of the pollinator world, maybe next to the bees. Um, they're, they're, they're gorgeous. They're a wonderful model. <clears throat> so therefore we use them as ambassadors because they catch attention due to their beauty and their grace. So we use them as ambassadors for you know, the entire pollinating world. Why do we need pollination? Who needs pollination? Do you like to eat? That is the question. If that is so, yeah, then we all need pollination. So what are causing the decline? Whether or not you, do, you agree with the seriousness of the decline, the findings found by the group, um, whether or not the USDA will declare, make this declaration or you know any kind of wildlife um, service here in the United States. <clears throat> there are, right out there right now is a perfect storm of things occurring that do, that do threaten the monarchs as well as some other um, butterflies, insects, things like that. The perfect storm that's going on for our friends, the monarchs are the deforestation, um, particularly in Mexico where many of them go, but also in Southern California, as well as South Florida. Um, the, the changeover in our the midsection of our country um, from grasslands to farmlands, well, yes, that's been happening for 200 years, <laughs> but now we're getting more efficient at it. Um, the use of herbicides and pesticides, not just amongst the farmers, 
but amongst everyone in their homes and everywhere. All that together, you know, creates a reduction of milkweed. Um, housing developments, business developments, all of that mixed together with climate change, throw in a uh, fairly typical disease or several diseases they can get. We're only going to cover one major one. Throw that in and you do have a perfect storm of <clears throat> challenges for our monarch friends. So you have all these things brewing around out there that are making it more challenging for the monarchs. So let's talk a little bit about migration. We, we hear about the migration and I wanted to learn more about, you know, their migratory patterns. What we hear a lot, a lot about, and that is what most of them do. They, um, they're gonna be coming from way north, even Canada. And in all parts of, you know, not all, most parts of the United States, even the Northeast. And they're going to go to a specific place in Mexico, specific places of which we will cover in a little bit so they can overwinter. But there are two other groups that do not go to Mexico. And we're gonna, you can see here, where we're talking about in Southern California, as well as all you lucky people listening from South Florida. <laughs> Those groups do not go to Mexico. They overwinter along this coast here in California, as well as South Florida. And I, when I was thinking about doing this, you know, one of the major questions I had is, why? Why do they go to Mexico? We just kind of accept that they do. We've heard that they are having problems getting there. We see these beautiful pictures, all these billions of um, monarchs together when they get there. What's going on? Why? Why do they do that? So, well, they're overwintering. Okay. Um, and they use their circadian rhythm to orient themselves with the direction of the sun. And they also use the Earth's magnetic field to fly towards the equator. Are we 100% sure of this? No. Are we 100% sure of any science? No, but these are the best answers we've come up with to this point. And it wasn't until the 1970s that scientists even found out where all these monarchs are going. Can you imagine being that scientist who encountered the, one of the mountaintops in Mexico? where there was nothing but just billions and billions of monarchs. That would be really amazing. And they followed them to an area approximately 70 miles wide outside of Mexico City. And that came from this Dickinson County Conservation Board um, link that I have at the bottom of this slide. So what are they doing? We said they're overwintering. Well, in the volcanic mountains, this is also coming from Dickinson County Conservation Board, there are forests of fir trees that were found to host the monarchs in the winter, Oya Mel firs, and they are very rare. Only 2% of the original forest remains. They only grow at high altitudes between 2,400 and 3,600 meters above sea level. Right now, only 12 mountaintops have been found to host the rare habitat for the monarchs. So these oil oyamel trees, these fir trees, create a microclimate where cloud cover provides consistent moisture. You're thinking, it's, that sounds cold, right? The cold temperatures allow the monarch's metabolism to slow to conserve lipid reserves during the winter without causing the monarchs to freeze unless there is a stretch of bad weather. Protective trees and shrubs also protect the butterflies from occasional snow, rain, and hailstorms. So the monarchs cluster together on the oil mill trees to stay warm. Tens of thousands of monarchs can cluster on a single tree. So that's what they're doing there. But as we mentioned, 
Most of them are going to Mexico, but not all of them. Some of them are California dreaming. The monarchs coming from east of the Rocky Mountains, they migrate to Mexico. Those coming from west of the Rocky Mountains, they migrate to the coast of central and southern California. Range extends from the Rockies to the Pacific Ocean and as far south as southern Canada. So by November, most are sheltering in trees from anywhere from San Francisco to San Diego. So that's pretty cool too. And I found that information from um, www.parks.ca.gov and from www.visitcalifornia.com experience, et cetera, et cetera, where the monarchs are. But here's exciting news for the Sunshine State. Florida also has a breeding population that does not migrate. That's in South Florida for those of you. And I know we have several people from South Florida who listen to our virtual plant clinic fairly regularly. So we get to hear about all the good things happening plant-wise and pollinator-wise in South Florida in their yards. South Florida hosts monarchs migrating from Canada who came to stay. Something we're pretty used to in Florida. So, you know, Canadians coming to stay, you're certainly welcome. Now that's South Florida. <laughs> Some of the North Florida monarchs will join the U.S. migratory population. And here's where it, you know, some of the debate comes in. How the heck do they fly over the Gulf? Some say they do, but others, as you can see from this, are kind of suggesting they follow the Gulf Coast. So they have some landing places. Now, what about the ones in my yard in Hernando County? I don't know. <laughs> we haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, you know, there's, there's an organization I'm going to talk about um, that is always looking for citizen scientists. So, you know, you can look them up. I'll get their name in a little bit and um, see if you can help track them. They do, you know, put teeny, teeny trackers on some of these. Um, butterflies. So I guess the question for us in Central Florida is the monarch in my yard, is it going on down to South Florida to stay there? Or is it joining that group uh, up in North Florida to go to Mexico? Haven't yet had, you know, a conversation with a monarch to be able to figure out where they're going. <clears throat> but you can go to um, St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge look that up on the internet and in October you can watch some of this migratory um, occurrence happen. So that is something fun you can do as well. Here's something that I learned in this research and it may seem pretty obvious but when we hear about the monarchs migrating from North America all the way down to Central America and Mexico I know my mind, you know, thought one butterfly makes that whole trip. That's just maybe the way it's said, or that's the way our mind works. Well, that's something new I learned. The monarch migrations are, are made relay race style by individuals from four different generations. So that monarch leaving Canada, they're not getting to Mexico themselves, but they're part of a process. So four generations later, so their great great grandchild is the one getting to um, Mexico. And, you know, four different generations each competing one leg of the journey. Um, they only live a few weeks. So the migrating um, butterflies, they, they live a matter of weeks. The ones that make the trip, the ones that got there to have that, the southern end of that trip, they're going to live a few months while they overwinter. And they you know, have that lipid slowdown thing that goes on. So overwintering butterflies have longer lifespans than migrating ones. But they're only going to get so far, lay some eggs, um, and then their life is over. And then the next group goes further up, and the next group furthers up. So kind of a really cool 
relay race. All that being said, you're here to wonder, what can I do? What can I do to help the monarch butterflies in this arduous journey that they've always taken? And of course, the answer you will hear is plant milkweed. And that is the most simplistic answer we can come up with, but there are steps and processes, things you need to know so that we help them in a responsible manner. Let's cover that. Milkweed is, of course, the host plant for your monarch caterpillars. They can only host on milkweed. There's lots of different types of milkweed. In Florida, we have 21 native species. So that is great, you know, for the monarchs that are out there in the wild. Never, never, never remove milkweed growing where you see it wild, especially, I mean, it's illegal to move it from a protected <clears throat> state park, national park, county park, anything like that. But if you see it growing by itself, certain types, and maybe it's the lot next door that you know is getting ready to be destroyed, then maybe there's some leeway you can try and save it. But don't get yourself in trouble for trespassing. You know, get permission of the property owner. And you have to weigh out. If it's there and you know that uh, piece of land, no one's going to bother it or disturb it or you know take all the plants out um the plant is safer growing where you know nature put it to grow wild it's going to do better it's going to be a struggle to transplant it even collecting the seeds um you know the plant decided to be there there's something about that location so let the plant scatter its seeds around that location if you know this area is going to be destroyed, then yes, then you can step in. If it's an area close to your house, if you find it far away from your home, then maybe, you know, find someone else who can try and rescue that plant. So <clears throat> these are the three of the 21 native milkweeds that have been successfully pro propagated and marketed um in a lot of our native plant nurseries so those would be this asclepius all milkweed starts with the latin name asclepius asclepius tuberosa we also call that butterfly weed but be careful because there's another plant called butterfly weed that is non-native i think to, to all of america and um it will attract butterflies, but it is not um, not the best plant at all. So Asclepius tuberosa. Also, um, I think they might call it sand hill um, milkweed as well. Then you have your perennis, Asclep Asclepius perennis. That's this white one. I want Asclepius perennis to be the pink one because it starts with a P, but I didn't get to name them. So Sclapius perennis is this white one. Sclapius incarnata is this pink one. These two, especially the pink one is a swamp milkweed. So that will tell you what kind of area it needs to be in. I have read recently that you can have the um, perennis, the white one, even though it does prefer wet areas. I've had people say they've had it growing in their regular yards um, without irrigation and, you know, doing fine. Now, there are also at least three others that milkweed enthusiasts, uh, nursery workers, nursery, nursery owners, um, master gardeners in their own yards, various people <laughs> have, are beginning to have more luck propagating and um, making marketable these three species. So you might find these available, this world milkweed. That's this right here. 
I've seen it in the wild growing. I haven't seen it in a nursery, but, and it's mostly just a stem and then everything's going on up here, pretty small. Um, white milkweed, this variegata, as well as this, this is the sand hill slash pine woods milkweed. Mostly pine woods milkweed is what you hear it called, or this Sclapius humistrata. See, this person's holding it up and I've, I saw some, photos online, so be very careful what you're looking at, of this with a whole lot of leaves standing straight up. So maybe somebody has hybridized it in some way, but every time I have seen this and only growing wild, <clears throat> it's a runner, likes to lay on the ground. Does not look like any other kind of milkweed you've ever seen before, except the flowers. The leaves are big. They are pretty big leaves <clears throat> and they're kind of purpley and green. And they remind me of cabbage leaves in some way, but it's a, it's a great looking plant as well. So on your search for these native milkweeds and with all the attention that milkweeds are getting lately, that's a good thing because that's going to help the plant suppliers, you know, people have more interest in buying it, therefore the plant suppliers will find profit in trying to provide it for you. But before you go anywhere, you want to ask certain questions. And you know, even if you go to your big box store, you are not likely yet, as far as I know, to find the native milkweeds in the big box store. Um, but that doesn't mean you should quit trying or quit telling them, <laughs> you know, to start providing it. But there are questions you need to find out. Um, before you purchase it, well, before you bring it home and incorporate it in your butterfly garden. Have pesticides ever, ever been used on these plants, ever? Do they have a built-in systemic pesticide? Questions you didn't think you needed to ask, but when people are doing wholesale, tons of plants, tons of the same plant, when you have a monoculture, you are going to have the pests for that monoculture. Therefore, they're trying to grow a large amount of the same plant. They're going to have a lot of pests. Therefore, they have devised a system to have literally an in, built-in systemic pesticide in some of these plants. Not a good idea for any kind of butterfly plant. And then you want to ask, what is their point of origin? Is this an ecotype from my region. We get so excited and we want to help <coughs> that we start getting milkweed wherever we can get milkweed from. And if that's Michigan, so be it. You're not going to have as good of luck. Um, even though it says milkweed, it might even have the same Latin name. But, you know, it's for a million years grown in Michigan. We need to find a kind that are, you know, used to growing in central Florida or, you know, wherever your region is. The same thing with seeds. Is this an ecotype for my region? Now let's talk about another controversial subject, the tropical milkweed, Asclepius carasavica. So this is the one you will find in your big box store and at your neighbor's house and pretty much everywhere. Why do we hear so much chatter <coughs> about how, you know, it's not a good milkweed? Will it attract monarchs? Yes, <laughs> um, it definitely will. Does it fill in faster? and look prettier aesthetically because it fills in a bed faster than your natives. Yes. <laughs> but let's talk about the downsides of this. This is also called Mexican milkweed. So why the monarchs go to Mexico, this is Mexican milkweed, what's the issue here? Well, <clears throat> for those of us, not in Southern California or not in South Florida. The problem is 
well, with our native milkweeds, even before we have a freeze, they're going to start to, for the season, kind of die back. There was a really neat, like, 50-year study that they did up near Cross Creek um, in Micanopy, Gainesville area, um, where land was <coughs> given for this study, um, pasture land. It was just let go to let the, the wild monarch or the wild monarch, yeah, the wild milkweed grow. And so then they studied um, the monarchs. And what they found to be of great importance over that very long period of time was timing. Because um, if the monarchs hatch out and the milkweed's not quite ready, um, you could lose a bunch of monarchs. <laughs> so if there's a weather event, something like that. Well, the kind of the opposite is with this tropical milkweed, it doesn't start to senesce, doesn't start to die back when the daylight hours are getting shorter. Your native milkweeds will. Why? Because those monarchs need to get south, whether that is South Florida or Mexico. They don't need to hang around in North Florida or Central Florida because they do not withstand freezes. Yes, we just said it got cold in Mexico, but remember, they're all huddled together and they're in that microclimate. So it doesn't die back naturally on its own. Why is that bad? It confuses the monarchs into staying around. There's food here, so I'll just stay around instead of being forced to move south. Okay, so they say the answer to that, and even the University of Florida, several sources will tell you, okay, um, cut them back, cut them back from Halloween till beginning of April. They'll keep trying to come back, so you have to keep cutting them back so that you don't confuse them. Now, I know the Xerxes Society doesn't feel very trusting that people are going to keep up with that. That's why they suggest just not having it. So that's, you know, one of the issues there. OE disease seems more prevalent when we deal with tropical milkweed. I'm going to skip that for now because I'm going to get into details about OE disease. All milkweeds are toxic. Any kind of milky plant is generally known to be toxic. So that's why monarchs have evolved to make it their host plant if it's toxic and they're ingesting it, but it's not toxic to them. That makes them toxic to their prey. Pretty smart, you know, evolutionary idea there. But they say this non-native Mexican uh, or tropical milkweed has higher levels of toxicity. So it's growing more. People buy it because it's easy. And so there's a lot of it. And so if this is their entire diet and they never get any of the native um, milkweed, then those toxins can build up to be a toxic level for the caterpillars. So that's one thing they throw out there. It is showing signs of becoming an invasive plant. Just the other day, one of my sisters sent me a picture. Is this milkweed? And it was tropical milkweed. You know, I just was like, yes, yes, it's milkweed. And uh, she said it's growing by my trash cans by itself. And I only answered her, uh-huh. Because we've had this conversation, you know, already. I've seen it growing on the side of the road where nobody put it. So I can even, you know, have personal knowledge that it'll pop up where nobody put it. And that's always, that's a good thing for native plants. But, you know, there has been talk, it could potentially become an invasive plant. So after hearing that, and after hearing about the uh, disease I'm gonna tell you about, if you are insistent, you're not gonna get rid of your tropical milkweed, at least do introduce native milkweeds as well and cut that back. If you are a snowbird, then don't have it because you're not there to cut it back. And if you're not gonna promise to cut it back all winter, 
you know, try and make the responsible decision. Let's talk about that OE, that um, disease there that you hear about with the monarchs. The code OE, because its name is Ophrysistis electrocera. Let's go with OE. It's a protozo protozoan parasite. Probably most monarchs have it to a point. Um, but the really infected, the severely infected adult monarchs harbor millions of these microscopic spores. So you can't look at them and know they've got it on them or no, they don't on the outside of their bodies. So what happens is they flutter around laying eggs, doing whatever they do around the uh, milkweed and those spores come off. So what happens is the larvae come out of the eggs you know, different monarchs come by, shake the protozoa off. <coughs> the monarch actually consumes, the larvae consumes those spores. And the parasites replicate inside of the larvae and the pupa. So monarchs with severe OE infections can fail to emerge from their chrysalises successfully because they are stock or too weak to spread their wings. Milder infections can cause monarchs to appear normal, but can't fly as well and have shorter lifespans. So they're not going to get as far as they need to get to lay eggs to continue that relay race. Here he is um, within the, the circle of the, uh, of the life here of a monarch butterfly. They're showing you the life cycle of the protozoa. So what happens is, you know, the butterfly scatters spores on the egg and the milkweed. Then the larvae ingests the spores, which can't really read that. They do something in the gut <laughs> and release parasites. Parasites penetrate the gut wall and infect the hyperdermal cells. Then the parasites, the now we're getting into our chrysalis, and then they replicate and they burst out of their cells. They replicate again, they mature in the hyperderm and hemolymph, that's the blood of the um, butterfly. They round up, they pair, they form a zygote, then meiosis occurs. See this black chrysalis, that's not looking good. Three nuclear divisions yield a spore with eight parasites. The butterfly emerges covered in spores, or sometimes it doesn't emerge. So why are we telling you about this? It's association with this tropical butterfly. I mean, I'm sorry, this tropical milkweed. The butterflies <clears throat> hang around the milkweed, the tropical milkweed, longer than they should. They're not practicing social distancing. More of these spores get spread among more of the butterflies. So that is, you know, that complicated uh, explanation there about the tropical milkweed. So. <laughs> However, you're going to handle this, whether you're going to, you know, do all native, which we would prefer. What we don't want you to do. I was listening to a comedian lately. He said that was his mother's favorite saying. He, she said it like one word. What you're not going to do. So here's what you're not going to do. What you're not going to do is <laughs> go buy all milkweed and have a yard full of milkweed. <laughs> I know that might be. Um, your temptation, your desire to help, and, you know, sometimes in our desire to help, we go overboard, just like with the tropical milkweed, we want to help, but we end up doing it wrong, and we may even be more of a hindrance. So, get milkweed, yes, but beware of having too much. At the nursery, as I mentioned before, Nurseries that are planting all one thing, 
that and there's problems with the monoculture, the diseases and the pests. There's nothing, there's no diversity to kind of counteract that. So be careful of it in your, the nursery where you buy, in your yard. Diversity is always the key to a healthy ecosystem. So don't run out trying to get as much milkweed as you possibly can. Don't freak out if it's all been eaten up and you think you need to go supply more. As hard as it is, if it's eaten up, it's eaten up. They're gonna have to go elsewhere um, to continue to find more. Not saying, you know, don't get some just do not, you know, don't go overboard, get rid of all your plants to just plant milkweed. See this one chomping away. He has some friends down here too. We're gonna get back to, I don't know whether it's male or female, somebody probably does, but, and somebody may also be thinking something in your mind right now, and I'm going to cover that, don't worry, as in right now. <laughs> Monarchs are not the only ones that can that use uh, milkweed as a host plant. They're not the only ones that like to munch on milkweed. So share the milkweed. Don't don't be one who is just like, I want to save monarchs, therefore I'm going to get rid of everything else that tries to be on my milkweed because I only want the monarchs to have this. I've actually had someone say, I think there was an imposter should I let it be there or should I spray it? Please do not ever spray it with anything ever. But also, so what if you think it's an imposter? <laughs> what, what the heck is that? Um, share, share the milkweed. So this picture was posted by a friend of mine, Brenda. She's a master gardener um, from her yard, this one on the left. And she said how great it was to see the monarch, you know, consuming her milkweed. And I took this one at the front of the extension office last year, I think. I didn't think anything of that. I thought, great, great, Brenda. Well, another master gardener, um, former master gardener, another native plant expert, Rita, who just did a class with me on native plants. Rita said, I'm Brenda, I think that's queen. That's a queen a caterpillar. And Brenda looked it up and said, oh my gosh, you're right. <coughs> so what are we looking at here? First glance, Steelers colors, it's a, it's a uh, monarch. No, not necessarily. You can see the differences now. See the red at the base of this antenna. See these other antenna, which he doesn't even have, let alone, you know, the striping is different. He's just striped. This one has yellow on top, you know, wrapped in the black. Its feet are surrounded in black and, and these ones are just white. So here we go. When I thought I took a picture of a monarch butterfly, look at the red of the antenna, look at this other one. It's hard to see its back, but Definitely, I took a picture of a munching, munching, munching queen <laughs> um, caterpillar here and some aphids. So just another thing to learn, but let everybody, let everyone come to the table. So here's what they look like as adults. And I got this from wildflower.org. And um, there's even a quiz you can take about the different monarchs. Um, so here's your monarch. Now on, on this side, on the kind of on the inside, it's it's hard to tell them apart. But once they open up, see monarch queen. You're like, what is the difference <laughs> this way? Not much, except um queen ones, <clears throat> some of these white spots will like escape into the orange area, which it does not on the monarch. And then when it opens up to the back, you can you can you know definitely tell the difference. So more stained glass looking. 
and then even the viceroy, you know, gets in on the act and it looks very similar too. My plan is let everyone come to the table. And there are other things that are going to eat your milkweed. Uh, deer have been known to eat milkweed, rabbits. The only way you're going to deal with either of those is by exclusionary methods because we don't want to use any kind of pesticides at all ever on our milkweed or anything in our butterfly gardens. People get very frustrated with these. That's why I put the picture of them, these milkweed bugs. They eat the milkweed for the same reason our monarch friends do, to make themselves toxic, which is why they have the colors that they do. Hey, I'm toxic. Don't eat me. You can remove them by hand um, or ignore them, depending on you know, how bad they are. You can dump them in a bucket of soapy water, something like that. Aphids, you can see, you know, every time I try to get a picture of them, at least one aphid, like this one, or a bunch, try to get in on the fun. Aphids, you can get a strong stream of water, try and knock them off, or if an area is particularly infested, <coughs> cut it back. Don't pull the plant out, but cut it back and let the plant grow back and, you know, throw them away. They say toxic tussock moths enjoy uh, milkweed. I haven't ever seen that, but that's an interesting thought. And then many others utilize the nectar and the pollen in uh, our milkweed. So we, we you know we want to grow milkweed, but we need to learn to have hands-off habitat. Build it, then let life happen. Don't micromanage the monarchs. Don't freak out because a wasp got one of your caterpillars. And so it's hard. I know it's hard, but it's the circle of life. And the real thing is they normally have very low survival rates. We think the answer is to rear them in safe, protected places huge amounts of them to give them a fighting chance. And that is our nurturing side wanting to do that. But in, you know, in reality, in nature, in science, we have survival of the fittest. They normally do have low survival rates. They're going to get eaten or something is going to happen to them. They have, you know, pretty low survival rates. <coughs> Always have from the beginning of time. Interfering with that, you know, making sure they have like a 90% success rate instead of a 10% success rate. What you have done is you've allowed the weaker ones to hatch out and then, you know, you've interfered with natural selection so that you can have unfit butterflies not able to make these migratory trips and then therefore um, jeopardize the entire population. You can make so many that there's just not enough food around for them and they're gonna starve to death or they're going to breed inferior butterflies, which will hurt the entire population in the long run. So again, even though it's hard, we wanna create that habitat and then we wanna let nature do what nature does. And there are more ways to help than just planting milkweed. Maybe you're in an apartment. <laughs> you can always put them milkweed in pots. Um, there's no reason not to have containerized milkweed. But there are other ways, other things you can do other than planting the milkweed. You can avoid pesticides. And by avoid, I mean no pesticides in your butterfly garden? What if your neighbor's spraying it? That's a question I don't have an easy answer for. Education, friendliness, um, barriers. <laughs> it's the only thing I know of. Support wildlife friendly, local, organic agriculture. Instead of screaming and yelling that this corporation is bad or those, you know, the corporation farms are bad, all this and that. 
instead of just yelling about that, make a difference with your wallet and purchase, you know, um, purchase food that has been grown in a manner that, you know, you can, that suits your conscience. Contribute to research efforts via community science, whether that be financially or actually volunteering to be a citizen scientist. Organize to push for policy changes on the governmental levels. Here's something we, you know, like that comedian said, here's what you're not going to do. What you're not going to do is order monarchs to be released for events. Please don't do that. They come from areas not near you, and then you release them in areas that is not where they're supposed to be. They are weakened by the whole process in the, in the rearing process. Again, the rearing weak. No, just don't do that. Support those wild areas. Um, you know, be in support, whether through your vote, through your finances, through your letters, <laughs> however you have to do it, so that we have more um, conservation areas, more areas where they will be protected. And however, you can go about reducing your carbon footprint. These are all ways that we can help all of the pollinators. Now, let's get to that rearing I've been alluding to, because uh, people love to do it. It gives them a good feeling. They feel good when they, you know, let these monarchs hatch out. Unfortunately, what happens is people, again, you are shielding them from um, the natural things that might happen that might help weed out natural selection. Also, we've known people just to release them like in February. It's like, they're, they're number one, or they're going to freeze or they're going to starve to death. There's nothing the nectar on out there. So we're not saying, and the um, Xerxes Society understands that, you know, it could be a great science experiment. It can be a great learning opportunity for you, your children to understand nature. So they're not saying no rearing at home. What they're saying is rear no more than 10 monarchs per year per household. That, that's the limit you're going to get to do. You're not going to rear these to sell. You're not going to rear these to, you know, be taken off at some event. If you do that, you want to collect immature monarchs locally from the wild, heeding, of course, collection policies on, on public lands, never buy, never ship the monarchs, raise them individually and keep the rearing containers clean between individuals by using a 20% bleach solution to avoid spreading diseases or mold. And her, of course, provide sufficient milkweed, including adding fresh milkweed daily. Keep the rearing containers out of direct sunlight and provide a moist but not wet paper towel sponge to provide sufficient but not excessive moisture. Then you got to go back. <laughs> Don't just release them in your backyard. Wherever you got them from, go right back there when you're going to release them. And of course, at the appropriate times of year is when you're going to be doing this whole process for your area. And you can find more out about that at the Monarch Joint Ventures. Um, they have a website. So just look up Monarch Joint Venture. They have all kinds of publications and also from the Xerxes Society, Keeping Monarchs Wild. Wild is always better. So let's talk a little bit about the landscaping that we're gonna do in our yard for all pollinators, which will also help our monarchs. So you wanna create a habitat. And that, what is a habitat but food, cover, water, and space? You want to provide the appropriate food, water, cover, and space for your monarchs. Have I mentioned this before? <laughs> pesticide-free zone must be a pesticide-free zone. As you're building your pollinator friendly yard, over time you wanna limit the lawn. It's a lawn like this probably has chemicals in it. it. It doesn't provide really anything good for any animal except too many open spaces 
where their predators can get them. Therefore, I call it the zone of terror. So you want vegetation, lots of vegetation for cover for your monarchs to rest, for them to hide. <coughs> you want a variety of plant species, not just monarchs, because when they hatch out, they need to nectar on things as well. And they'll nectar on a huge variety of plants. And not just variety and diversity of plant species, but plant sizes, plant heights, plant widths, plant shapes, <laughs> plant textures. All these things create great diversity for all of the wildlife. <coughs> you can create what we, um, what people are calling way stations. Um, the idea has been out there a long time. I think they just put this, this name of way stations um, on it. Um, you can create a puddling area. They, monarchs and well, all butterflies don't just get minerals and moisture from flowers as much as we would like to imagine that. They've been known, well, they'll get it from mud and that's fine too. That's where you can create a little mudding area for them. They'll get it from manure. They'll get it from carcasses. They'll get it from where they need to, but you can create these, uh, not like bird baths. They don't need that much water, but this moist area and the puddling helps them get the minerals. And also someone came up with this idea of, you know, just a basking area, just, just to land and rest a while. <clears throat> I already mentioned, you know, having lots of diversity of different types of plants and lots of hiding places for them. Um, but that one house I showed kind of backed up to the woods. If you are in a situation like this, which is highly likely for many people in Florida, just think of planting those islands of vegetation, which are going to grow over time and, you know, give all of the pollinators chances to get from one place to the other safely and, you know, that they'll feel comfortable. Remove invasive plants. They're going to be in competition with what you're trying to accomplish. And I just had, you know, one of my, uh, you know, the people I confer with want to know uh, if there's a bumblebee on her Mexican petunia, why is that bad? You may ask, there's tons of butterflies on my lantana. How is that bad? I'm going to have a class coming up on um, pretty darn invasive. Yes, they're pretty. Yes, they can attract wildlife. I mean, that's how they could spread a lot of the times. But overall, in the big picture, when they are responsible for crowding out the native plants that the host specific uh, critters need, then they are more danger than they're worth. That's the quickest way to say that. And that's another class. Another thing you don't want out in your caterpillars, cats and cats, <laughs> caterpillars and cats don't go together well. The only truly, only truly indoor cats don't affect wildlife. You may say my cat's so fat and old, never gonna bother anything. No, yes it will. Cats hunt because cats hunt, not because they're hungry, not because they're bored, but because they hunt. And having an outside cat is discouraged by many, many, many groups, um, and they're in danger, especially around here where I live. There's an outside cat or somebody comments on a Facebook post, have you seen my cat? I always think, uh, probably not good news. So, you know, we have coyotes. We have other things. It's just safest to keep your cat inside. If there are feral cats around, um, you know, I'll stay out of your garden. A long-term solution is a, a, you know, a trap them and then spay and neuter and then re-release. So at least that they don't um, create more generations that doesn't help you in the here and now. Um, so, you know, don't feed them purposefully. And I know that's hard because you want to have all living things or just clean up whatever's attracting them to your yard or, you know, if you're just truly wanting to help them, then 
trap, spray, neuter, adopt, keep them inside. <laughs> and there's also a uh, link for information about that from the University of Florida. As I mentioned, uh, monarchs need nectar. They need more, the caterpillars need the milkweed. Once they are grown, they nectar on many, many things. And here's just a list of some of the things that they've been known to nectar on. Um, of course, the milkweeds, frostweed, giant ironweed, lyre leaf sage. You would look at that and think it's a weed. The monarchs love it. Spotted bee balm, black eyed Susan, blue mist flower. Spiked blazing star, azure blue sage, narrow leaf sunflower, scarlet sage, scorpion's tail, goldenrod, and firebush. And a lot of these are pretty easy uh, to find, um, you know, just around the Master Gardener nursery. Um, you can call local nurseries, or I think I have information at the end about finding native nurseries. I found this today. I thought this was a great graphic. It was from Virginia Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program. And it's telling you to think like a pollinator and they're particularly talking about bees, but butterflies are going to benefit. So the only thing here that I would say to disregard because it's from Virginia is where they mention specific plants that won't grow here. Other than that, it has this great <coughs> go native, of course, be showy, be showy with whatever plants that you have, be bountiful, have lots of them, be patient, be gentle, be chemical free, be homey, make small piles of branches to attach chrysalises or cocoons, provide hollow twigs, rotten logs, um, with wood boring beetle holes and bunch grasses and leaf stumps, old rodent burrows and fallen plant material for nesting bees. Leave dead or drying trees for woodpeckers. Be sunny. Yeah, your butterfly garden has to be in the sun for most of those plants. Be a little messy. Uh, must, most of our native bee species, 70% nest underground. And um, so avoid using weed cloth or heavy mulch. Same here, same here. Be aware, observe pollinators when you walk outside in nature. Notice which flowers attract the bumblebees um, or solitary bees and which attract butterflies. And be friendly, create pollinator friendly gardens both at home, at schools and in public parks. Help people learn more about pollinators and native plants. I thought that was a very great graphic there. We've talked quite a lot about monarchs, but I don't want you to think they're the only thing that's facing challenges out there. We have federally threatened or endangered insects in Florida. Most of them are from South Florida. We wouldn't ever see them in Central Florida, but you know they're doing pretty poorly. So the American burying beetle, the Bartram's scrub hair streak, Cassius blue butterfly, a South Florida butterfly. Serenus blue butterfly. Blue butterflies are, they just have a difficult time. Florida leaf wing. Miami blue butterfly, very rarely seen anymore. They're only seen in a specific conservation area in a, like an island, other than in labs where they have saved a few. Miami tiger beetle, pretty isn't he? Knicker bean, blue butterfly, and the shoss swallowtail butterfly. We see lots of swallowtail butterflies, so you're thinking, what? Well, this is just a particular kind. This is just to show you there are other things out there struggling, and everything we just learned will help all of the pollinators, all of the insect critters out there. And before I go, let me tell you a success story about the Attila butterfly. That is another South Florida butterfly that you know we weren't likely to see in Central Florida anyway. But in South Florida, this butterfly was thought to be extinct 
all the way from 1937 to 1959. And the University of Florida says, due to over-harvesting of the root of Kunti by early settlers. And they leave it at that. And I would like to argue with that just by common sense. I don't think there are enough early settlers. <laughs> there were some, and I'm sure they did some damage. But come on, let's talk about development as well. <laughs> that affected these Kunti. So now they're considered rare with limited distribution. They're no longer extinct. They found them again. It is found in local colonies in Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties, and also in several Caribbean islands, including Cuba, the Bahamas, places like that. Why? Why did that happen? Why did that turnaround occur? Was that a specific effort? Not really. <laughs> we stopped eating the county. What they did was they would dig up the roots and make a starch product out of it. And we started using it as an ornamental. And I think there's more to it. I think the more people pushed native plants and you had to have a certain percentage, you know, different developments, the Kunti, for whatever reason, were somebody out there thought, well, people need native plants and this Kunti is pretty easy to grow. So now there's an, not an abundance, but a good amount. It's not hard to find Kunti. So they started putting it back and guess what? At least in little bits in isolated communities, this butterfly that they thought was extinct has come back. So that is a fantastic story <laughs> to end with, but just remember what we should do for our monarch friends is plant that native milkweed, provide a good habitat for all pollinators, plant a diversity, of flowering plants and stagger those bloom times. So summer blooming, spring, summer, fall. Support the preservation of the wild areas. Use your purchasing power to encourage sustainable agricultural practices. It makes more sense to do that than to yell and scream on Facebook and then go, uh, you know, be a consumer of the products that you're yelling about. So make changes with, with your purchasing power. Reduce your carbon footprint. Embrace the circle of life. Not every one of them is going to make it. And that's going to have to be OK. Here's what not to do. Here's what you're not going to do. What you're not going to do <laughs> is plan a monoculture of just milkweed. Or rely on the easy tropical milkweed for all your answers or allow the tropical milkweed to grow from Halloween to the beginning of April. You're not going to interfere with the natural processes in your garden. You're not gonna rear more than 10 monarchs in captivity per year per household. It's just gonna be a science project. It's not going to be a hobby or a career. You're not gonna order monarchs to be released for an event. And you're not gonna purchase plants or seeds for areas outside of your range. Just remember, no effort is too small. No effort is too small to have a positive impact. If we all did just a little, we are going to make a big difference. Here are the resources, some of the resources that I used. And like I said, email me. I'll be glad <coughs> to send you these links for this information. There are more fusses, as I mentioned at the beginning, that are coming up about our friend the monarch. This one um, is um, by Pinellas County Extension Specialist James Stevenson. I've yet to meet him, but I've become a fan online. He's a fantastic teacher. So on August 17th at 2 p.m., he's going to have a class. Um, there's a link here. You can go to Brooker Creeks. Facebook page to find the event and sign up. You do have to sign up for it. He just wants you to know that they will explore this wild plant's biology and ecology, not how to grow it for yourself. And then the Hernando County Extension Office is partnering with different uh, specialists at the university. So August 26th at one, um, they're gonna have the monarch butterfly by Dr. Jarrett Daniels. He's a professor 
<clears throat> at the Department of Entomology and Nematology and curator at the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera and Biodiversity. He's going to know a whole lot more than I did, so that's going to be a great one um, to attend. Look at Hernando County Extension's Facebook page and under their events. <coughs> and then on September 23rd at 1, Jim Davis, their director, is going to present Attracting Butterflies to Your Landscape. So you know what they say, the more you know, the more milkweed will grow. <laughs> so my email again is lilyb at hernandocounty.us. I have a Facebook page, I have a Twitter account, an Instagram page, and please go to Hernando County Government YouTube and look up all of my classes. And this one will be available on YouTube probably within a week or two. So I want to thank everyone for listening. I'm sorry that this was pre recorded, but I thought such a hot button issue might attract. Um, Oh, it might attract a lot of people, which in turn might attract people trying to scam you or hack in or something. So this was the best way to do it. And um, I appreciate everyone who listens. And I hope you all have a wonderful Florida friendly, Florida friendly week. We will see you again. And thank you.